ladies and gentlemen, Mike Mignogna. Notice we both kind of fudged our last names, couldn't be the ones really sure how to pronounce the other guy's last name. <laughs> Mike Mignogna, Kurt Bissett. You did fine. Yeah. I must have screwed up though. No, no, yours was good. It was just slurry. Or my, 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 we're, we're tired. It's Sunday. Are you guys as tired as we are? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we're also old. We're exactly yeah, the true. same age. Wait, I think I recognize somebody in the. We were all outside when you guys came here, but you didn't know who was in front of us. So, everybody introduce yourselves. I'm Polly. I'm Kurt. <laughs> I was looking, and I was being waiting to see them. <laughs> Unless you guys have radical objections, we're just going to throw it open to questions right off. Unless anybody's got a current axe to grind. I think Fortune introduces us all. Go ahead. Everyone's already introduced themselves. It's, it's a us. test to see if he knows who we are. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're in charge for it. Okay. Uh, well, starting on that side, we've got J.J. Jones. They didn't clap for us when we introduced ourselves. We didn't do it as well. Uh, all right. It's fear. <laughs> Whose reputation, reputation presumably precedes himself, but uh, what do you throw out as your biggest credits, Jeff? Say that again. What do you, what do you think are your best known credits? Um, the Unwanted. Your big movie. I thought it was just my curmudgeonly attitude. <laughs> Um, I guess Warren is the reason they dragged me on this. And, and next to Jeff, we've got Dolly Hamner. <laughs> whose creator on Wildstorm titled Red just came out on DVD and Blu-ray last month. And who, who met Helen Mirren? What's that? Who, who met Helen Mirren? I mean, I mean, you are endlessly jealous of us. You got cut for <laughs> Helen you, you actually touched Helen Mary, didn't you? I shook hands with her. Yeah, sure. that's, yeah. that's good enough. Uh, <laughs> did she shoot you? No, unfortunately. I, didn't, I wasn't that lucky. Kurt Busiak? Kurt, I'm sure you've touched a lot of celebrities in your day, too. What's that? I'm sure you've touched a number of celebrities in your day as well. Not that I'm willing to admit to in court, yeah. Oh, okay. And then, I, the guy who touched Ron Perlman. Ooh, and <laughs> oh, oh, That would make you beauty. <laughs> Only by comparison to Ron. <laughs> she has an age well. One thing, you know, and uh, I agree with Mike, I think it's going to be primarily a lot of Q&A from you guys. Uh, and if anyone has anything to ask, probably start queuing up soon. But the one thing that's interesting to me about the people on the de this day is, is there are a lot of different ways that comic book material gets into Hollywood and a lot of ways that stuff gets made. And everyone up on the stage has a totally different story, I think, about how their first property or first project, I always have a problem with people referring to any of their creations as a property. Uh, made a transition. I know that with Wanted, it was an executive, Mark Platt Productions, who saw the first issue in the first Diamond catalog and started making phone calls and made sure he saw it before anyone else got it. Red had been out for years and took two amazing writers to do a basically a spec screenplay and get it sold to Summit. Kurt, I know you have been fielding offers and turning down offers for since probably issue one of Astro City. <laughs> Maybe issue six. And are now in a, what sounds like an amazing situation where you're also getting to write the screenplay. The treatment at least, possibly the screenplay. We'll know that soon. And then, Mike, I, I just have to assume, too, that everyone was beating down your door. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to ever make that movie at all. Nobody ever wanted to make that movie. Not one person wanted to make that movie, except Guillermo del Toro. Who fought for six years trying to get a, a movie that nobody wanted to make Get made starring Ron Perlman. <laughs> <laughs> so miracles do happen. But I think it's a testament to how hard people work to get that going that, I mean, 
no one ever really wavered, right? I know that studios and back in the Sony day were throwing all kinds of crazy notes at you guys to make massive changes and to catch what if, the What if he just turns red when he's angry? <laughs> it's true. If you've ever been in a room with these people, you can't believe the things they say because you go, you know, you know people parody you guys. But when they parody you, they're actually saying stuff that's less stupid than the stuff you actually say. And they're somehow completely unaware of how, oh, it's, it's really, truly amazing. Jeff, do you have any experiences you want to share in the process that you're going to want it going? Um, a lot of my experiences are things that I really can't talk about because they involve Mark Miller and he'll sue me. <laughs> but a lot of the problems getting our contract together were basically more skepticism. He didn't want to do the movie because he was skeptical that anyone actually wanted to do it. So I had to beat him over the head and tell him that I needed the money desperately. So <laughs> roll in. <laughs> For you. That is the tricky Mark thing when, some, some, yeah, yeah, the Mark is, is when something's created by two people. That is the tricky thing because, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's funny because in my experience, um, you know, um, you know, Mike's experience is obviously a bit different because he writes and draws his own work. But like, you know, JG and I have talked about this a lot about being, you know, paired with a star writer on a property, you know, <laughs> and being the artist. And you know, a lot of times in, in Hollywood. They have a lot of trouble seeing the artist as a creator, which which I've noticed a lot, and it's not which is even the case if you wrote it. Which true, I mean, I, I would imagine it is, you know. And it's but it, but they have no choice but to deal with both of you. You know what I'm saying? And and in my in, in my case, a lot of times I had to kind of fight for you know like a, equal kind of consideration in, in terms of you know am I going to be at the same things that Warren is or you know that sort of thing. And it, you know it's. It's it's just an, uh, an attitude that's pretty prevalent, I think, in Hollywood. You know, uh, I think a lot of times they see you know writer as creator, artist as hired hand. And, you know, and I, I think that, you know but you've got two creators on a book; they're two creators. You know, I mean, the fact that you're talking about them being concerned about the writer alone is, is pretty amazing. Since this is amazing. Hollywood is this notorious is for not giving a shit about the writer. Yeah. It totally is. Yeah. And that's really the sad thing is. is bad as Cully is making his experience a sound, they're a lot better than things used to be. Uh, also, with artists actually getting more involved in the process now. Yeah. So, it's it's baby steps, but hopefully by 2050 uh, everyone will actually be involved in that material. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. The first uh, the first rights deal I made, I think, follows a pretty typical pattern. Um, I was doing shock rockets with Gorilla Comics through Image, and uh, Nelvana, the animation studio, actually tracked me down while I was on vacation at my in-laws' place to say they were interested in the rights and did I have an agent. And I said, no, but I'd get an agent. And so I called Neil Gaiman and he connected me with his agent and he passed me off to, since it was a television deal, Neil's agent is a movie agent, he passed me off to a TV agent who I won't, I won't name because I'm about to criticize him badly. Um, and, and we went through a couple of rounds of negotiation with Nelvana, and then the agent just stopped doing it. And, and a year later, someone from Nelvana called me and said, what's going on? We can't get any, any answers out of the agent. And I said, well, the last thing I knew, we asked for like three changes and the contract was done. And uh, they said, uh, yeah, well, I don't think we ever got that. We have been asking questions and getting no answer. Um, so I fired the guy and had my lawyer finish up the deal. And uh, the funny part about this deal is Nelvana was a client of the same agency. So they, they stood to make commissions on both sides of the deal and they couldn't bother to do it. Um, but the deal was done and of course you all remember the Shock Rockets cartoon show. Uh, and I, I think that's the typical part of the story. They they, they developed it, and they they, uh, they they were they were all excited, and then nothing happened. And a, a couple of years ago, uh, somebody Universal was interested in Shock Rockets, and I I had to say those rights are 
owned by Nelvana, and they called up Nelvana, and Nelvana said, oh, no, no, we gave those rights back. And so they came back to say, no, no, they didn't tell us. So, so, uh, uh, so I, think that's, I think that's the fate of most projects in Hollywood. They, they, they start off you know, with people very excited, and then they, they, they slowly vanish. And uh, that's why the experience of having someone like Guillermo del Toro determined to make it and make it right, that's what gets you through. Yeah, it's hard to do this stuff without a champion somewhere down the line. If you're counting on a studio guy, you know, a lot of these studio guys, if they're very hot, that moment, and they'll, you know, but they got 60,000 other things, and they go on the shelf, and they disappear. A lot of it, this stuff also is, got to get the rights so somebody else doesn't get it. Yeah, I mean, it's a very common situation now more than ever, too, that a lot of series will buy material because they want to make sure that something that's similar that they're already working on doesn't have a competing project. There are so many comic book properties that I know have been optioned in the past two years alone just to kill them. And obviously they don't tell the creators that going in, and the creators are usually not going to know that. They're just going to know that there's a check at the end of the deal. And that's well, I mean, you, you walk down the hall at the San Diego convention, and you always, there's always a guy going, <gasps> they, they want to option my thing. And you see him, he's so excited, and you go, that's so cute. <laughs> it's so cute. They gave you a thousand dollars, and you're you're, sure you're going to go shop for a house next week. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. You know, on the amount of conversations uh, I've overheard in San Diego alone, with a, I'm such a big fan of your work. What have you done? Good questions. Hmm? Questions. Anyone got any questions? Sure. The microphone. Yeah, go up to the microphone. As a matter of fact, anybody who's got questions, line up behind you. Just line up. Yeah. I just kind of wonder what, uh, what were the worst Hollywood head of ideas that they might have a pitch to you in trying to, well, get the rights to your stories or something like that? Fortunately, I didn't have to be in those Hellboy meetings. Um, Del Toro shielded me from that because he said, believe me, you don't want to be in the room with those people. <laughs> but I co-wrote a novel that's a World War I vampire novel and the very first meeting where I was in a room with the producers or the executives, the, somebody started off with, the thing I love about this story is that it's timeless. Perhaps. Well, it's, except it's World War I. She goes, you know, and we, in fact, we could set it now. <laughs> like, I can't believe you people really say shit like this. Yeah, and, and as development went on this thing, I'm convinced they wouldn't have stopped had we not finally just bailed out because we just couldn't stand the bullshit anymore. I don't think they would have been content till they had that thing set on a space station. It was just mind-boggling. Horror story? Yeah, I, well, on After City, I'm thankful to report there haven't really been any horror stories about creative input. Um, on, on Shock Rockets, we had a couple of moments where they wanted to make, you know, they wanted to do it in, in a way that looked sort of like graffiti art because the kids like that. Um, but we, uh, we got the classic, they need a dog. Can we, can we, can we make them all kids and give them a dog? And, and I said, well, it's a kid's show, and it certainly doesn't hurt the concept if you make them all like teenagers. And we can give them a monster, but not a dog. And so we, we gave them a monster, and you've never seen the monster, and you're thankful for it. But, but it wasn't a dog. But that's, that's, that's the worst I've got so far. So the front of fall on their face, who do they blame? God knows. Yeah, I mean, there's always going to be a different scapegoat. I mean, one big problem with stuff advancing is also one of the things where a lot of things go wrong is a lot of people leave, come and go during the process, get fired, or go on to look at bigger, better, bigger and better situations. So a lot of stuff's going to be scapegoated on whoever's not there anymore. Well, also, like, you know, with Hellboy, no, oh, it's going to be hard not to name names. With, with Hellboy, you know, it's like you had people that were really excited. A few people that were really excited, not, I'm not talking about Del Toro, really excited about that first movie. And then when you come back on the second movie, they go, yeah, we knew it wasn't going to work. Like, it, because, you know, it's, it's just, it, there's no, 
nobody sticks to their story. It's just everybody's covering their, hey, boy, am I going to sound negative. There's real positives to this stuff that I can also discuss, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a screwy business. Um, first, I wanted to say that Guillermo del Toro is awesome, but um, <laughs> uh, my question is, do you think that um, the superhero film genre will be able to uh, stay around for the long term, or do you think it will end up collapsing like uh, the Western genre did back in the 70s, or do you think that the uh, source material is abundant enough to where it won't happen? Well, if it lasts 60 years like Westerns did will be fun. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I mean, once upon a time, you know, when they started with the first superhero films, if, if like Daredevil came out and it tanked, they'd go, oh, that's it, you know, you know, comics, you know, can't be translated into film. But enough of them had, like, yeah, like Batman many. and Spider-Man had made so much money, you know, nobody's going to say, wow, well, they don't, you know, you can't do it. It's like, no, clearly you can. You just can't do right. all if, of them. If, if another Catwoman comes out, they won't say, oh, superheroes don't work. They'll say, that one didn't work. And if you, you, you can look at it like it already has lasted a couple of decades at this point. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you know, yeah. if you look at a graph, I mean, you'll see like this, but there, there's a steady stream of superhero movies coming. And yeah, you look at what makes money in the summer. I mean, I think superheroes, was this last summer that there were almost none? I couldn't believe it because yeah. as soon as these things started making money, these things are getting greenlit right, left, and center. Uh, and I think they're going to be there every summer. At least one, probably five. Yeah, there's like three or four this year. Yeah, yeah. so it's a genre that will expand and contract over time. But it, it, <laughs> it won't be, you know, nobody says that romantic comedy didn't do well. Let's not do any more romantic right. comedies. They do say things like after uh, How to Train Your Dragon came out, and, and uh, it didn't do as well as predicted in its first weekend. There were executives saying, no more humans and no more fantasy. <laughs> Animation needs to be about animals and it needs to be realistic. <laughs> and then the second weekend came in and the third, and I, none of those guys ever said that anymore. <laughs> I think another point is you guys use you say comic book movies, and you're, what you're talking about superhero, superhero movies. Yeah. But there's so many more genres now. Um, nobody remembers <laughs> Road to Perdition. I had a graphic novel, and it was an amazing movie. Um, and now, with a lot of self-publishing and small press, there's so many more opportunities to do different types of material than just, you know, a bad Daredevil movie um, <laughs> that still makes money for but I mean, I kind of think that superheroes have become the new science fiction film. You know, yeah, so it, it's yeah. what, what's happening because they have, especially the Marvel and DC stuff, they have some name recognition. Uh, and, and that versus trying to put something out there that's original. Original is, is getting to be a real scarce commodity in yeah. Hollywood. You know, let's get an old TV show or a comic book character or something because nobody wants to, to gamble on something that doesn't have some recognition factor. Yeah, there's two Red Riding Hood movies in the works. There's a Snow White movie, there's a Hansel and Gretel movie. There's, I mean, I was making jokes about fairy tales I hadn't got to yet, and then I found out, yeah, no, those are in development. Yeah, too. and what sparked the fairy tale thing? Because I, I saw something recently where they said, yeah, here are all the fairy tale movies. I think they're all Twilight. I think well, that it's just, it, it, how can we do something romantic horror? And somebody said, <coughs> Little Red Riding Hood. Well, but now what happens if that uh, Snow White tanks and everybody's like in mid-production on all this stuff that's supposed to ride on the coattails of that? They'll turn it into a musical. <laughs> <laughs> They'll slap 3D on it and then turn it into a musical. Yeah. Just add it all. Cynical <laughs> bastards. Yeah. That's my production company name. <laughs> I, it's, I think it's probably painting. <laughs> How hard is it to do the Punisher? Seriously. I mean, you don't have to do his armor. You don't have to make him fly. You don't have to give him a bat cave. He's a nut with guns and a skull painted on his chest. <laughs> I mean, Charles Bronson was doing that without the skull 40 years ago. <laughs> the falling 
Down was the best Punisher movie ever. <laughs> I mean, Commando is a Punisher movie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Just, can I add something? Yes. Um, do you think that uh, Hollywood will steer more towards less extreme things like Watchmen and Kick-Ass since those movies didn't exactly do as well as they hoped? Um, can you repeat the question? What, uh, what, what do you mean by less extreme things? I mean, compared to, say, um, Spider-Man, Watchmen is pretty out there. Uh-huh. And do you think that they will, that Hollywood will not choose material like that and go instead for things like Green Lantern and, um, the new Superman movie that's going to be coming out here soon and things like that? Well, only Warner Brothers can do Green Lantern and, uh, and, and Superman. So if, you know, Paramount wants to make a superhero movie, and they do, then they can't have any of the Marvel characters, they can't have any of the DC characters, so they're going to have to find characters someplace else. Um, they're not going to do a, a uh, two-hour, 45-minute long movie with a giant blue penis in it. But that doesn't mean they're not going to be doing something out there like Watchmen. They're just not going to be doing something that you need that many showings to make your right. money back. Yeah, your, 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 big, your big budget blockbuster Hollywood pictures are probably going to be your safer bet superhero yeah. things. But like Road to Perdition and, and, and History of Violence, these are small little comic book you know, films. Uh, and I'm sure nichier little superhero kind of things uh, you know, we'll have a place on cable or TV. I mean, I'd, I'd much rather have a guy take something and make it small where they don't have a studio saying, can he just turn, you know, red when he's angry uh, because we got to open it wide, you know, in the summer. Thanks. But to, uh, I mean, I'm working on the Astro City film at the moment. Let's hope it goes all the way. But... Um, I was kind of surprised because I've been expecting at every stage to get the, uh, thank you, this is great, you're fired. Um, but, you know, I turned in an outline for the treatment after discussing the story material with them. And uh, uh, I was expecting to get notes back about making it bigger, easier, more commercial, more action. And all the notes I got were about bringing through the, the, the theme, the, the sort of artier aspects of it. Ooh, that's great. And so I was good there going, oh boy, <laughs> boy, didn't we get in bed with the right people? <laughs> um, because, because, you know, I go in expecting the Hollywood experience. And so far I've been getting, you know, we value your ideas, we like your ideas, and not only that, but when it comes to walking the walk of saying that sort of thing, they actually do. You know, they would say... What studio is that? It's uh, Working Title Films. The people who made uh, Love Actually, who did the Coen Brothers movies. Mm. Wow, well, yeah, that yeah. says a lot right there. Yeah, when I, when I met with them the first time, they said that, uh, that, that graphic novels was an area that they really were looking to get into, but every time they looked at a graphic novel, it was all about people hitting each other. <laughs> and they make movies from character outward. So it was hard to get into what was available. When they saw Astro City, they said, we don't know how to make a movie out of this, but we understand it. <laughs> this is from this is working from character outward. This is our kind of thing. And I said, yeah, what I want to, you know, the people I want to be working with are people who can do character, you know, drama, humanity and who can add spectacle as opposed to people who can do spectacle and think humanity is irrelevant. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, first of all, I think the reason for the one million um, fairy tale movies is Alice in Wonderland made a billion dollars. Oh yeah, that's right, of course. Yeah. Um, and I got two quick questions. One, um, with the sex of Walking Dead and the pilot of Power being shot, do you think the future of more Nietzsche or long form comic books or graphic novels is in television? And second, is there any superhero or comic book that would be greenlit that you would just say, oh boy, we're about to hit a, you know, a valley as far as comic book movies go? <laughs> I, I, think, I think the real storytelling on film right now is in television. 
Uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that if you look at television in, in the, in the in the 70s, it's usually referred to as the vast wasteland and film was the real art form. And nowadays, if you look at most of the films that make money out there, they're pretty vapid. And a lot of the really interesting storytelling is happening not only just on television, but on cable. Yeah, yeah. Network television is, is the junior wasteland. Right, right. <laughs> and then cable is the junior wasteland. <laughs> well, and, and especially if you, you think about like if you're talking about like the the superhero kind of stuff, which I you know we haven't seen a lot of that you know with Cable, I guess Powers is kind of the, the first one of these. But if you want to show a real arc to these characters, being able to do it across you know six episodes versus two hours, uh, it's 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 a better format maybe. Yeah. It's, again, depending on yeah. the kind of character, but you know. But also, I mean. You are asking if the future for this is on television, and there isn't any one future. Right. Certainly, right. a future for that right. is on television, but a future for that is in features as well, um, uh, and and probably you know syndicated animation and whatever else, um, you know, streaming on the web or something. We'll be finding new futures all the time, and uh, and and there isn't there isn't ever comic books. The comic book industry has been driven by superheroes for 40 years now. Right. And, and so we tend to think in terms of the one thing. But once you get outside of comics, there's lots more than one thing. So, so I think you'll be seeing interesting comics projects on TV, but you'll also be seeing them in the movie theaters and you'll be seeing them other places. Thanks. So have you heard of the new Wonder Woman uh, uh, TV show coming on? Have we heard of it? Yeah. 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 And also, what do you think about... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so also, what do you think of um, 3D in theaters? And what's your opinion of... 3D? Yeah. I, I doesn't do anything for me. Yeah. I actually can't see it. I, I have a, a, an ocular condition that I, I can't really see the process that they use. So I, it's lost on me. My rule of thumb is if a movie was made in 3D, I'm willing to see it in 3D. If it was converted to 3D, forget about it. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a good one. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the, oh, you know, uh, yeah, it's but, it's a bad warning sign. If it was, if Thor wasn't the 3D when it, the, uh, when they showed the first trailer, but, but the third trailer, Thor was the 3D. <laughs> I don't know if that, it's a good sign. I mean. But uh, when uh, when they were doing promotion for True Grit, the Coen brothers were asked, uh, you know, what about 3D? Can you see yourselves doing a 3D movie? And they said, uh, you know, we, we wish we could do black and white. <laughs> and the minute I heard that, I thought, I want to see a 3D black and white Coen brothers movie. <laughs> But, I mean, it's all just another tool, and 3D, 3D seems like a stupid, lowest common denominator tool until somebody does something great with it. And then we'll be going, wow, what a cool idea. But so far, <laughs> it's just flash. Yeah, because um, 3D to me it seems like it takes away from the scenery. What's that? Because to me, um, if you're in a 3D movie, it just takes away from the, the scenery. For the 3D movie. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. I've noticed that in the past decade or so, um, film companies have been making movies that show, like, comedies about superheroes, like, what a superhero story would be like if it was different, like uh, The Incredibles and Megamind and Sky High. Um, do you think this will eventually become outdated and wrapped on by critics? I'm sorry. I, I heard all the beginning up until the actual question part. Um, up to Sky High and, and, and uh, uh, The Incredibles and so forth, you went into your last clause and I didn't hear it. Um, do you think this will eventually be outdated and wrapped on by critics? You mean superhero comedies? Yes. I hope not. 
Um, I mean, I, superhero comedies, western comedies, romantic comedies, science fiction comedies. Comedies are cool. Um, dramas are cool. Action movies are cool. Um, superheroes shouldn't be limited to, to, to one thing. Um, I remember when Incredibles came out, before it came out, John Byrne was knocking it, saying they're making fun of superheroes. I think, I think The Incredibles is one of the, one of the most, one of the best treatments of superheroes on film that we've ever seen. And, and it's and funny, the best, too. And the best Fantastic Four movie we'll right. ever see. <laughs> <laughs> the word that I used after I saw it, the, the, that I kept saying over and over again, was it was joyous. I, I felt joyous and interested. Also, I have to say that, you know, the reason Sky High will always have a, a, a place in my heart is the credits, the font the credits are done in is Astro City. <laughs> <laughs> That's a naked poem. <laughs> yes, indeed. If only they gave us a screen credit. Have you, have you seen the specials? I haven't. Specials? Specials. No. no. What is that? It's, I, I know it's a superhero, no. but I don't know much about it. Um, also, uh, it seems that uh, most superhero movies based on comics are generally PG-13 live action. Boom. Do you think this will change in the future? Like, instead of people coming up with their own and making, never mind. Well, I think the two, the two instructive movies in that regard are uh, The Watchmen, which was not PG-13 and didn't make as much money as they wanted it to make. And so probably there will be a strong push to keep them all PG-13 until Somebody comes along with an R-rated one that makes a lot of money, right. makes everybody forget Watchmen. Yeah. Um, and Hancock, which was a, we made up our own superhero, and I, I, it was kind of a mess and didn't make as much money as some of the stuff that wasn't, you know, that, that had more name recognition. But this will, you know, these are all... The way things seem to work is, if something comes out and it doesn't do well, people say, let's not do something like that again, until they forget about it, and somebody comes yeah. along and says, I've got a really good idea, and he's going to stay red all the time, and he's going to beat the crap out of monsters, and it works, and then everybody says, let's do more of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. It'll never work. Oh, wait, let's greenlight five of them. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Hellboy, nobody wanted to make it. It sat on a shelf someplace, I think it was before Del Toro was attached to it even, and then Spawn came out, and for about 30 seconds, it made a lot of money. And a screenwriter literally showed up on my doorstep. I mean, I knew he was coming. I got a phone call. This guy's going to meet you next Monday. And because Universal had kind of gone, hey, you know, don't we have a hell movie that's sitting on the shelf? Quick, let's just get this going. But by, by the time the screenwriter and I had finished having our conversation about what the Hellboy movie should be, Spawn stopped making money. And then you couldn't get anybody on the phone ever again. Um, so that's how that stuff <coughs> tends to work. Yeah, we, we heard from an awful lot of people about Astro City from a week before Watchmen opened to a week <laughs> after it opened. And after the second week, <laughs> no more. Like oh, yeah. It's like, well, it's like talking to people about, you know, Hellboy, after Hellboy 2, there was about a week there where there was a lot of talk about TV shows and this and this and this and this, and then Batman opened, and you're like, hello? Is anyone there? <laughs> like, it's like you thought the Universal building had exploded because there was just like, you couldn't even get a, you know, a secretary. Thank you. Hi, uh, I had a question about the idea of making remakes of old superhero movies, like the two Incredible Hulk movies. Like, what is your opinion on that subject? Like, there's a new Spider-Man movie coming out, or like, supposedly a remake, or...? Well, well again, first, it, it, it's hard to call it a remake when they're just going back to the source material. Yeah. Like, like True Grit wasn't really a remake, I don't think, of, or just, it wasn't just a remake of... Yeah, the, no, technically the it's movie, a new right? adaptation right. of the novel. Because you've gone back to the source material. So, well, not necessarily remakes, but different approaches or different ideas. Right. Yeah. 
especially some something that happened like five years ago and then you're trying to start over and do it again today or now. Like, it, is it is scary when Spider-Man needs to get restarted now yeah. and you go, isn't the old one's not even cold, man? Yeah. <laughs> it's not even nine well, years old. There's a whole generation who hasn't yeah, seen Yeah, but I think, I think in Spider-Man's case it's because the movies were making money. Yeah. They wanted to make the next one and Raimi and the studio had enough differences on how to do it that you know, everybody walked away, but nobody walked away from the idea of doing a Spider-Man right, movie. Right. They walked away from doing that one, and at that point they said, well, if we're losing the guy who made it work, you know, all the actors are 10 years older than when we started, <laughs> let's, let's, let's start over. Um, you know, I, I, I want to interject though, I mean, adaptation is a part of film. I mean, you know, there's no reason to come. Nobody ever asks, you know, when are they going to stop making films out of books? You know, is anybody going to get tired of film versions of books? You know, comics are just, it's just material to adapt and, you know, we go back and forth and it's, it seems like a natural thing to me. There's no yeah. reason why you, why you shouldn't adapt comics to film. And there's also no reason why the first time you adapt something to film, that becomes the canonical thing that you can't change. Right. I mean, if that happened, Spider-Man would be the movie series that starred Nicholas Hammond back in the 1970s, <laughs> yeah. and you would have never gotten any more Spider-Man because that wasn't very good. And Batman, of course, <clears throat> the guy in the 1940s with the gun and the ears that went like this would be the, you know, the only Batman movie. Um, I kind of would. I kind of missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, sure, you go back, you know, what they're doing is they're going back to the source material, to the comics and they're starting something over, starting something new, um, rather than continuing on from the last version, which was, in fact, a remake, you know, re reworking of what Christopher Reeve had, uh, had done, which was a big success that made people forget the George Reeves, which was the one that, you know, after the previous Superman stuff, which I don't know who was in it, Kirk Allen? Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on, you know, it's, and if you add in the TV shows and the cartoons, the number of adaptations of Superman is huge. But it's also a good point about the, the, you know, nine years of an entirely different generation, or a different audience, because as a guy who's 50 years old, I just kind of go, wasn't that just yesterday? But if you're, you know, 14 and now you're 24, I mean, it's a big, it's a big yeah. gap of years. And also, to continue on the idea of making remakes, like, what, do you, what is your opinion on remakes of old movies, not necessarily superhero movies? Like, last year they did a remake of The Karate Kid, and this, right now they're shooting a remake of Footloose. Like, what's your opinion? Well, yeah, Footloose is basically a sacred text, so the touch is bad. What's your opinion on making remakes of old 70s or 80s movies, not necessarily superhero movies, or ba anything based on comic books? The Wizard of Oz is the third time they made that. Yeah. The Maltese Falcon is the... No, I think The Wizard of Oz is the fourth or fifth time they adapted that story to film, and The Maltese Falcon is the third. So, uh, remaking movies is fine if they remake them good. Mm -hmm. And if they remake them bad, don't bother going and seeing them. Yeah. Uh, the problem right now is Hollywood's so skittish about making money that everything is an adaptation or a remake, and they're not doing much in the way of original right. stuff. Um, but at the same time, you know, if somebody called me up and said, we want to remake Lady Hawk, I'd say, I'm there. Because Lady Hawk is a cool idea and it was a crappy script. I'd like to, you know, I'd have fun making that into a good story with a good script. Yeah, I, I wish that they would try to, re they, would, they wouldn't remake so many great movies. I wish they would take crappy movies like, you know, Ocean's Eleven and make it, you know, and do what they did. Which is make a, you know, a really cool movie out of a really crappy movie. You know, I don't really think they need to, need to remake Manchurian Candidate. Except that no one will watch the old one because it's in black and white. Yeah. Yeah. On, on the other hand, remaking True Grit turned out to be a really good idea. That, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's, a, there's an exception to everything. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm a, an animator and I work in TV. Um, I haven't worked on any of your shows or anything. But I just wanted to say that on behalf of like crews who do adapt things that you're not happy with, the amount of times I've been in a studio, I've been working on a scene, I go, oh, why did they do that, <laughs> you know? But we do the best with what we can do, yeah. you know? So, having said that, I would like to hear some like, positive stories of, of all of your adaptations where you thought, actually, 
that was, that was a good idea. Or, you know, I had this idea and they nailed it. They put it up on the screen, you know, and it, it, it worked, if there are any. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you any because I haven't had anything put up on the screen yet. Um, I feel, a film adaptation, as Kali, I'm sure, and you know, it, it does wonders to sell books. Yeah, <laughs> it really does. That, I will say that. That was, that was a, a nice boost. But you know, when, when uh, you know, I let somebody option Hellboy, I mean, I knew they'd never make the movie. Uh, <laughs> one of a billion times I've been wrong about things. Um, but I instantly also made up a new character because I thought, well, what if they do make it? And it's Howard the Duck. And there's so much stink on it that I've created my dream <laughs> job over here and I can't touch it again. So I may had to make up a lifeboat character. So basically everything I was planning to do with Hellboy, I could slide over into this other character. And I've had that character sitting over here, you know, for 15 years. And I'm finally going, maybe I can do something else with that character. Because I think Hellboy isn't going to turn into Howard the Duck. <laughs> Though Hellboy 3, if it happened. But, uh, I don't know. There's always the risk. Unfortunately, his, his uh, lifeboat character is named Limbo Jumbo. And, uh, <laughs> Seemed like a good, a good name at the time. <laughs> Thank you. Was that, I guess that well, was a positive well, story. Is, is there anything they did with Red that was different from the comic that you liked? That you, that you, thought, that you thought, that was a good idea, I wish we'd done that. Well, you know, I, the, the comic we did was so, uh, it was so kind of short and lean and mean and, and what I, honestly, I thought that the changing of the tone was probably a good idea in terms of getting an audience involved in it because, you know, what we did was, it was kind of exclusive to people who really liked those kind of nasty, you know, types, type of stories, you know, really violent, you know, type of things and, and I enjoyed what they did. I thought that the tone of the, the humorous tone was was a lot of fun, but there was still the basic idea of what we did in there, which is you know the kind of uh, uh, you know Warren likes likes to call it the, the unexploded bombs of the 20th century, the, the people of the you know the weapons of the Cold War that just get cast aside and they're still dangerous. That's still there. Um, they're just cheerfully dangerous. They're just cheerfully dangerous. <laughs> but you know it was it, it was a romp, and I think it you know it worked out. It was it was it was a good choice. You know, and, and the movie did well, and, and you know, I, I appreciated what they did. I wasn't so married to what we did that I, I took it personal. And what about uh, Unwanted? I mean, Wanted went through major, major changes. But we're, oh, I was surprised we ever sold the thing because how are you going to make that? <laughs> One of the characters is a giant walking collection of evil turds, and you shouldn't <laughs> put that up on the screen. No, and that, that, that's what runs the studio. <laughs> But most of Wanted was um, comic book in-jokes and bombs that Mark was throwing at DC characters because they wouldn't let him work at DC anymore. Um, <laughs> Best revenge. So they kept the first 20 minutes of the movie is the book, and then it's something else. So that's, that's exactly what happened with Red. It's like the first 15 minutes is very similar to the book, and then it's its own beast from then on. Yeah. You know. But I was happy with it. So gentlemen, along this line, a question for all of you. Is there a property that you've ever created, given the inherent changes that Hollywood will impose on your creations that you just don't want to sell, that you will never sell, that you know, this is my thing that works in this medium and it doesn't need to be translated elsewhere? I wish I had not sold The Amazing Scrunt Head. Um, Though a lot of people love it as an animated thing, it was my baby. It was a thing I did just for me, and I, I just, I've never been able to watch the cartoon. Um, but it was, again, it was one of those deals where I said, well, no one's going to make that. You'd think I'd learn that after Hellboy, you know, but it's like, well, this one's so much stupider than Hellboy. And, and somebody offers you option money, you go, it's free money. They're never going to make it. I'll just pocket the dough. And in a year and a half or two years, I'll get the rights back, and maybe I'll, you know, somebody else will option it. And I'll just keep getting this free money. And like six weeks later, the guys call me saying, "Oh, we, we got a deal." I'm like, "Jeez, oh, that's you know." So if you don't want, if if it's your baby, you roll the dice, uh, and and it is a rolling of the dice, you know, with Hollywood because unless it's your money that's making that movie. 
um, it's going to be somebody else's say how it turns out. Yeah. You know what you, you said about the, the, the film goosing the sales of the books? You know, your books are still there. And if it causes more people to buy your books, then more people are going to see what you did. But you will live in the shadow of your movie forever. Because people I know who are fans of the comic, they will still come up and talk to me about Hellboy things, and they blurred it with the movie. So, I mean, even a moderately successful movie is going to reach a much wider audience than a comic. So, I mean, if you're League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, you make out great, because the movie's so heinous <laughs> that the horribleness of it sells the book. Because every review says, how could they ruin this, this wonderful graphic novel? Um, but yeah, I live in the shadow of the Hellboy movie. So, so apparently that's the ambition. You want them to make a bad movie. <laughs> <laughs> that, where the reviews tell people that the book's good. Right. Uh, I, I, was, I was at my table yesterday and two little boys walked by and they were like about maybe 10 years old. And they saw my banner and they were like, oh, look red. It was a comic. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of people get that. Yeah, but, I get that. Well, I guess the follow-up then, is it ultimately then just a fiduciary consideration? Um, one thing the money can buy you is... Cookies. Cookies. <laughs> Those are good. And for a lot of guys, especially like um, Cully and I, who are work-for-hire artists for the most part, we are, we finish one job on to the next because we have mortgages, we have bills to pay. If you can buy yourself a little time to do pet projects, it's a gift. And it has been for me, it's allowed me to um, start writing more, which is something I did when I first got in the business, but then it's chasing job, chasing job, chasing job. So that's what it's been for me. I don't know about you, Colin. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, my, my plan is to kind of do that in the next couple of years, but you know, one thing that was, e even with this project, since, DC and, and Summit wanted to capitalize off of it a little bit. Uh, I got the chance to do uh, a prequel to the original book that we did, and I got the chance to write it because Warren, you know, didn't, didn't want to write it himself. So they, they they were like, "You want to write it?" And I was like, "Well, I don't get to write very often." So yeah, that that's an incentive for me to do it, um, and it's not something I, I often get the opportunity to do. But yeah, uh, you know, especially if they do a sequel. Uh, uh, I will probably, you know, at some point, you know, you know use that, you use the money I make off of that movie to say, I'm not going to do work for hire for a year and, and work on something of my own, you know. And I, I think tubs and hookers. Exactly. Oh, you, you, you read my pitch. I did. Yeah. <laughs> in, in my case, uh, for years, I would have said that, you know, the movie that the, the project I would never want to see become a movie is Astro City. <laughs> Um, and what happened was eventually one guy showed up who wouldn't go away and telling me, you know, it could work. It could, you know, it could be what you'd like it to be. It could be good. And that began a years long journey that so far hasn't driven off the cliff. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I also, I mean, there's a, there's a fiduciary aspect to it. Um, not that, oh, I want them, you know, I want the money for this, but I want Brent to have the money for this. I want Alex to have the money for this. Uh, uh, they've put a lot of years into it, and if I feel precious about it ever becoming a movie, well, what I'm doing is I'm blocking them from, 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 from that kind of thing. And so I have to, I have to focus on the fact that, that it's not just mine. It's theirs, too. You're the one I like. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear what your opinions on animation and the animation industry are uh, in regarding to, like, earlier you were talking about really safe moves that Hollywood makes, like, they're doing all these fantasy things because that's what sells right now and they're afraid to do anything outside of their comfort zone. And animation is something that everyone's really careful about right now. Like uh, like a lot of people don't want to see Disney movies because they're afraid because they love Pixar too much. Like I know Pixar's nine films have made more money than almost any other franchise. And so like, 
besides like the Goon and uh, I think one other one's coming out soon, I, like, do you think animation could be a good medium for comics to go into? Like, is there hope for that, or is that dying down? I, I would like nothing more to see a really good animated theatrical adaptation of a really great superhero story. Yeah, I mean, I think so there's, not, there's, it's done. there's nothing specific about animation, I don't think, that makes it better or worse than live action. It's just, it's if, if the thing is done by the right people and it's done well, it, it, it can work in any any medium. Um. What do you want to see animated? Um, well, I know like there's a lot of movies that they make live action that I don't think it's necessary. Like the new uh, Green Lantern movie. Like I don't have a problem with it, but they made a huge deal about oh well since these constructs are made of light we should CG everything and motion capture can be great but it. If everything is CG, it doesn't always translate well. And they could have made a 3D film or like a motion capture film, and it could have looked—I don't know—it could, it could have been perfect if they would have gone with like, I don't know, um, I don't know. I, that that I think Green Lantern was like supposed to be a cartoon because like comics are such a visual, a visual art form, and that. I think it, it. I don't know. I think I think it deserves that with the whole with, with okay. the um, everything. Now, now what I want to see is I want to see a 3D CGI animated Legion of Superheroes movie. Yes. But oh. I want it to be black and white by the Coen Brothers. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I mean, also we're getting in this weird weird place where Avatar is pretty much an animated film. Yeah, I mean, there's and and I think what what I saw of Green Lantern looks like an animated film. Uh, so there's this weird, blurry, in between thing happening. But you know, that's what happens when you have special effects heavy films. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, is there any project of yours or somebody else's that's either stuck in development hell somewhere or bombed the first time out that you think? could be actually a great success out there, either if it gets out or on a second try? Well, the only, uh, the only things I've sold at all are uh, Shock Rockets and Astro City, and Astro City is at the moment moving forward and Shock Rockets is on a shelf somewhere. So the only option I've got to answer is Shock Rockets, but luckily I think that could be a really cool <laughs> movie. <laughs> and uh, I would love to see it, you know, picked up by somebody and, and uh, uh, and, and done as a you know big budget action film. I think that would be a lot of fun. So that's my answer. Can't really think of a way to answer. And you, you, you sell everything with the expectation they won't make it. <laughs> yeah, but, I don't I, think but, I've only, but I've only created two things, <laughs> uh, and and they both got made. I mean, screw on head. There's still talk of somebody doing a screw on head thing, and I've had, you know. Conversations with different people about what they would do, and you know. Oh, oh you know, you know what would make it a great. We were just talking about a fully animated superhero movie, Zop. Yeah, it should yeah. be live action on Earth, right? Yeah. And CGI, including the Earth characters, on Zot's world. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I, um, I have a question about options. Uh, is there a standard uh, reversion clause on, on these? Because you hear about... It's uh, all about what you negotiate. There is almost always going to be a reversion of rights in an option. Usually the kicker is going to be somewhere between 9 months and 18 months uh, with pre-set or pre-agreed upon extension periods to elongate the term of that option. The big difference is when you actually do a sale of that option Reversion is going to be years and years away if it's ever attainable. Most times now it's closed, so if you actually sell it, it's bought outright. Yeah, an, an, an option is short for option to buy. So they're buying a period of time, and that, you know, it's not open ended. An option is always an option for 18 months or for nine months or however long. Um, and any reversion, you know, if they just don't buy it, that's not a reversion because you haven't sold it to them yet. Um, it's only after they buy it. And somebody like, uh, you know, like DC will always have reversions built into their their deals, even after you 
make a Superman movie. Eventually, DC's going to have those rights back. Um, uh, but uh, but if you're not a major media corporation, you can't get that kind of clause. Okay, so for something like say Spider-Man, um, Cold Dead Hands comes to mind for oh. Sony losing the. Sony has the rights to Spider-Man. Marvel would get those rights back if Sony stops making Spider-Man movies for a certain period of time. That's why Sony's never going to stop making Spider-Man movies. Yeah. It's the same with the X franchise and Fox. It's just never going to go back because they're always going to do something every three years. Thanks. And I, I think they've been signaled for time. So. so, thank you very much. Thank you.